This episode is brought to you by Progressive, home of the Name Your Price tool. You say how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. It's easy to start a quote. Visit Progressive.com to get started. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, October 29th, 1948, the Donora smog kills about 20 people and causes respiratory problems for almost half the population of the 14,000 people living in the factory town of Donora, Pennsylvania. It's a city about 24 miles southwest of Pittsburgh. So what was this smog? Well, as the name implies, the smog is a mix of pollution and atmospheric conditions. It's warmer air trapping colder air near the surface of the town, and this mixing with pollutants from the local steel mill, a thick, yellow, acrid smog hangs over Denora for five days before the weather finally shifts and the pollutants dissipated. But in that time, the damage was done. Deaths, lingering health effects, and also, very interestingly, maybe a little wake-up call of sorts for the community. This is a story not just about industrial pollution, but also one that shows that calls for environmental justice, as we call it now, came a lot earlier than maybe we realized, or at least I realized, in this country. So let's talk about it all here. As always, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. I want to talk about this plant and the after effects of this smog and concerns about this plant going back for a long time. But let's actually just go to that day in this town because some of the the scenes and the picture of what it means to be in this town of Donora in this stretch with this smog is, is kind of stunning. Well, you started with that description of smog itself, right? This mixture of smoke and fog that on the morning of October 27th is so thick that like People are still going about their business to a certain extent. Students are going to school. They have to use flashlights to be able to see in front of them. Even cars that are trying to go, there are a number of traffic accidents um, because even your headlights don't quite cut through this very thick, dense fog. People are coughing. It's clear that there's something different about this smog, right? It's not just a hazy, foggy morning. It's something else. And that becomes really clear when the hospitals start to fill up. I mean, this is a scene right out of, you know, Italy in early 2020 of hospitals just suddenly crammed with people with respiratory illnesses, people starting to die, they're running out of room. Um, So it's a pretty dramatic scene pretty early on. Yeah, and it's one that doesn't dissipate very quickly. I mean, you are days in this sort of thick uh, fog and you can't escape it. You can't, you know, some people might say, well, why yeah. don't you just leave town? Well, you kind of can't leave town if you can't see through the roads. You were essentially trapped in this town. And if you were in the town, probably trapped inside your home or trapped inside of a building. And the emergency response is shaped by this, right? So you have a member of the Board of Health who's leading an ambulance through the streets on foot because they can't see anything. The street lights are on but aren't illuminating enough for people to drive safely. You have firefighters and doctors who are trying to travel through town to bring oxygen tanks to people who are suffering. But again, like it's just very difficult to make it to where you need to go. And so the whole sort of landscape and response is being shaped by the fact that there's a real environmental blockage that is causing this problem. Yeah. And I mean, you know, to point out something that I think we see in a lot of these instances, it's the most vulnerable who are the ones who are least able to Mm -hmm. kind of pack up and move. Right. And so you have the elderly who are trapped in their homes and that's the people who end up suffering a lot. But, you know, I I have this reaction all the time when to your point, Kelly, like, why don't you just get up and leave? You know, and I mean, all sorts of natural disasters. It's like, well. I feel like there's sometimes a little lack of empathy in there, a real understanding yeah. of what it means to like actually get up and leave. Go where to? You know, a lot of people don't have yeah. just another place that they can go to or they don't have the resources to go somewhere else. And I mean, you know, obviously like during a hurricane you should follow evacuation orders, but I understand why sometimes people can't leave. And there weren't evacuation And even orders if you try, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> the traffic. I mean, like you've seen in in uh, with like Hurricane Katrina, it's like when there's a 7-8 hour pileup, you yeah. know, or or a traffic jam. There's no way you're going to get out um 
in time. And, and this town, you know, like a lot of these stories, right? It's like isolation is is a huge part of it in every sense, right? Top to bottom. Geographic isolation, isolation inside a home, isolation from your community. And so that really is the, the people who end up suffering the most here. But yeah, they, they can't, literally just can't drive out of town because they can't see. Um, any other thoughts about the sort of uh, conditions on the ground that day? Or should we talk about where this smog came from? I mean, one of the things that was remarkable to me was that the hospitals were so packed full of people that they had to take a community center and basically convert it into right. a morgue because they couldn't take on any more bodies. So it just goes to show you that, you know, even in that short amount of time, people are scrambling not just to help people, but to place the dead that are quickly dying from this inhalation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even though the death count isn't super high, I mean, twenty people die in the then the span of the the smog. Half the town is sick, and you don't know. Yeah. Like, are those people who are sick? Are they going to die? Is it just going to be the people who ha have compromised health and who are older? That's ultimately the people who died here. But you've got to imagine the sense of panic that was gripping this town when you have the bodies piling up and all these sick people, and you don't know that they're going to get better. The factory does get ordered to close, and I guess maybe we'll talk at the end about sort of the immediate aftermath of this. But let's cut back now to where this smog came from, the context in this town, the um, the American Steel and Wire Company and the Denora Zinc Works plants that both live in this town, both run by the United Steel Company that it's set up in this town. You know, this is classic factory town, right? We're talking about, a t I think a town mm -hmm. of a little over 10,000 people, 5,000 or so are employed uh, in these two factories. As soon as I saw U.S. Steel and as soon as I saw Zinc, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was like, oh, it's a wonder that this didn't happen more often. Because yeah. you know, these factories, first of all, they were almost always located among vulnerable communities. Um, and they put out the most disgusting stuff into the air, right? It's not just smoke. It's smoke that's laced with the byproducts of processing zinc, which is not a health metal. Um, and there are complaints about this factory and what it's doing. Look, it, it creates a one-mile dead zone around the factory where nothing can grow. That's not a great yeah. sign. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> And so there are complaints about this and court cases about this as early as like the 19 teens. Yeah, it's to me, it's always a bad sign when you can't grow grass. <laughs> like, when, you can't have, when you can't grow basic plants, like when the environment itself is telling you this is not hospitable to life, like that, to life, that should be a real sign that um, this is not a place that you want to live. But, you know, this is this town is not that much of an anomaly. I mean, you had a lot of company towns in which half the town, a third of the town worked for the automotive company mm -hmm. or for the steel plant or things of that nature. But there weren't a lot of regulations about how to protect the people that lived in those environments. And so, you know, Denora is not alone. There are a lot of cities across the country that have this environmental impact um, that, you know, detrimentally affects people's health. And sometimes it wasn't caught for years. Right. Sometimes you lived with just chronic, you know, health issues, unaware of what was really causing it. But this this was clear. You're used to hearing my voice on the world, bringing you interviews from around the globe. And you hear me reporting environment and climate news. I'm Carolyn Beeler. And I'm Marco Werman. We're now with you hosting the world together. More global journalism with a fresh new sound. Listen to the world on your local public radio station and wherever you find your podcasts. I think as we've seen time and time again, I mean, that's the sort of plausible deniability that a lot of these places have is saying, oh, yeah, these elevated cancer rates, you know, they happen decades later. We can't really connect it. But in this case, Nikki pointed out that like as early as the 19 teens, I mean, 1918, three years after this uh, factory is set up, some residents of the town are awarded a legal judgment because they bring they bring action saying that this has harmed health. And then in the Depression in the 30s and 40s, there's other uh, court cases and there is real pushback. I mean, obviously, the U.S. Steel rebuffs them, is able to sort of tie it up in lengthy legal proceedings. They um, 
you know, were at one point told to retrofit their factories to create less pollution and they sort of drag their feet on that. But I mean, to me, you know, part of this story is kind of, and maybe this is just, I don't know the history of this as much, but you know, I was sort of surprised that there were even legal judgments in the teens and twenties against the U.S. steel for environmental uh, pollution. There's this whole movement in the 1900s and 19 teens that was led by women actually in cities to do something about smokestacks and the pollution that was being put out by factories. Um, they were devising all sorts of techniques for finding out like how heavy and dense the smoke was and what kinds of innovative technologies you could use to scrub the smoke or make them produce less, putting limits on when smokestacks could be producing. Um, and it runs into a problem by the 1920s of people being like, oh, yeah, it, yes, there's an environmental problem, but what about the economics? This is going to cost companies too much. Right. And that's the calculation that happens here too. U.S. Steel is like, well, we could pay these people some money for poisoning them, um, and that's going to cost us less than retrofitting this this factory. And let's be honest, they're not paying them a lot of money no. either. Some some people never receive any money at all. Most of their money is lost to legal fees and lawyers. So there is not a lot of compensation for people who live in these towns. To illustrate the twisted logic of a company like U.S. Steel in a moment like this, in the 30s and 40s, rather than decrease the amount of acid they're putting out into the environment. They instead distribute limestone to local farmers to neutralize the soil that had become too acidic so that they could continue to grow crops, right? And so so there's a tacit acknowledgement there of like some sort of skewing of something going on. Well, and remediating soil is very different than remediating lungs. Um, yeah. So something yeah. is getting fixed, but a lot of yeah. other problems are lingering. Um, so we get to this moment in 1948, fall of 1948. I mean, this is around Halloween. It's worth acknowledging. I mean, I'm, this is not a quote unquote spooky, spooky death story, fog. but there is this fog, <laughs> yeah. this death fog over this town in this Halloween period. It does dissipate around October 31st. Um, because it rains, basically. basically there's a yeah. rainstorm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. no, the, it's, it doesn't dissipate because the U.S. Steel does something. It dissipates because the weather shifts. <laughs> um, yeah. They do, shut down the, they do shut down the factory for a week. Um, and yeah, it's, it was, to restate those numbers, you know, 20 people kind of die in those five days. Another 50 or so die of respiratory causes within a month or so. And then 14,000 people are sick, uh, you know, deeply mm. sick uh, in, the, in the weeks and months after this. Um, one last tidbit is there is an attempt to at kind of an investigation as to what exactly happened here. You want to talk a little bit about that or any attempts at kind of. Yeah, recommend? this is what is mind boggling to me is that they sent in investigators and they're run out of town. Like people get handguns and basically threaten their lives and run them out of town. And that is because their allegiance to keeping these jobs and having the income surpasses their ability to like maintain good health it, it makes no sense but at the same time i think during those times when this was all people had this was a life or death situation um in terms of their ability to survive with the one job that they had and I think you can see sort of the corporate influence on the final report that actually comes out after people are allowed in to investigate. Um, essentially, the Public Health Service says, well, the temperature inversion, so that warm air that comes through to create the smog that gets trapped in the town, um, ah, it's a, it's a freak of nature. It's a weather incident, not caring to put the blame on the factory that had put the toxins in the air in the first place that made a normal temperature inversion, a, a normal smog event into something that was deadly. Yeah. Well, that act of God language, I mean, we talked, we did an episode on um, the Johnstown flood, you know, mm -hmm. sort of the same region, mm -hmm. you know, 50, 60 years earlier, but that was the same language that was used there in the final reports. Um, and, you know, that's as much a kind of dismissal of the root causes as it is a sort of slippery legal, legal loophole that you can use to not actually have culpability for, for what the companies were responsible for here. Um, all right. Well, we should leave it there. Um, the word smog, no surprise, it comes from London. It had kind of been popularized in the years and decades before this. This was one of those key moments in the history of smog. Maybe our first episode in the history of smog. But we'll, we'll But not that. our last. Not our last. Not our last. <laughs> Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. Sure. Thanks for listening. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Our transcripts, which you can find on our website, are done by Kala Nakua. 
This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, creator-owned, listener-supported podcasts. Audrey Martovich, executive producer, Yuri Lasordo, director of operations. Thanks to all of you who support this show by being members of Radiotopia. Find transcripts, sign up for our newsletter, find us on social, suggest topics, all that and more at our website, thisdaypod.com. See you soon. Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is an all-in-one management software with apps for every business need. Odoo has apps for CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, manufacturing, and everything in between. And they're all in one easy-to-use software. And the best part about Odoo? All Odoo apps are integrated, helping you get things done faster and more efficiently. So when you think about business, think Odoo. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash this day. Radiotopia.